Good evening and welcome to the 2021 Apex Awards. My name is Brian Tollison and I'm your co-host this evening. I'm the president of the Washington State Bar Association Board of Governors. Currently I work in the greater Tacoma area as a mediator, arbitrator, and hearings officer at Black Robe Dispute Resolution Services, PLLC. Hello, everyone. My name is Kyle Schichetti. I'm the immediate past president of the Washington State Bar Association. I come from the southwest Washington area corner of the state. I live in Vancouver, and I practice as a partner with the law firm of Miller Nash. We are delighted to bring you the 2021 Apex Awards live from the Washington State Bar Association Conference Center here in downtown Seattle. So sit back and relax and grab a bite to eat from the fridge. The Apex Award celebrates the luminaries of the legal profession across the state as we acknowledge professional ex excellence. Before we get into the show, we'd like to thank our sponsor, JAMS Mediation, Arbitration, and ADR Services. Everyone at JAMS congratulates and thanks tonight's winners for their outstanding service as part of the legal community. And let's also give a round of applause for the 2021 to 2022 Board of Governors. Your President-elect and District 4 Governor is Dan Clark. Your at-large governors are Hunter Abel and Jordan Couch and Alex Stevens. Your District 1 Governor is Sunita Angevel. Your District 2 Governor is Carla Higginson. Your District 3 Governor is Lauren Boyd. Your District 5 Governor is Francis Adewale. Your District 6 Governor is Brett Pertzer. Your District 7 North Governor is Matthew Dresden. Your District 7 South Governor is Serena Sayani. Your District 8 Governor is Brent Williams Ruth. Your District 9 Governor and Treasurer is Bryn Peterson. And your District 10 Governor is Tom McBride. Thank you, Governors, for your leadership and for volunteering to serve our members and the people of Washington State. I also thank our Bar Association Governors for their many hours of volunteering and leadership serving our members and the people of Washington State. Throughout the evening, please feel free to congratulate our award winners on Twitter using the bar's handle and hashtag below. Well, let's get on with the show. First, our first group of deserving recipients include the Outstanding Young Lawyer, the Legal Innovation, and the Professionalism Awards. We end the group with the Sally P. Savage Leadership in Philanthropy Award. And take notice of the many presenters here we have tonight. Uh, many of them are familiar faces. I'm Washington State Representative Tara Simmons, and it's my pleasure to introduce this year's winner of the Outstanding Young Lawyer Award, Paul Heer. This award recognizes a lawyer who has gone above and beyond to serve their community and the profession, all within their initial years of practice. Mr. Heer is an associate in Foster Pepper's Investment Management Group, and he has parlayed those legal skills to become a fierce pro bono advocate for the Seattle Clemency Project. To Mr. Heer, I offer my respect and heartfelt thanks. As a fellow young lawyer, I understand the determination it takes to carve out time to pursue the projects you are truly passionate about. And from firsthand experience, I understand how critically important it is to reform our criminal legal system and help formerly incarcerated people reintegrate into their communities. In addition, what you did for my dear friend, Eugene Youngblood, cannot be articulated in words. You spent hundreds of hours in a labor of love to fight for his freedom. But according to him, you were much more than a lawyer and made a genuine connection and he always felt cared for. Mr. Here, you offer hope to those who need it most. And I cannot wait to see where the next years of your career take you. I sincerely thank you for the contributions you are making to make our world a better place. My name is Paul here, and I'm an attorney at Foster Garvey. I work in the investment management group. I remember when I was a kid, I wanted to be like my grandpa. He grew up in British-occupied India. He had to learn how to participate in a legal system that wasn't built for him. Hearing those stories 
incorporating them into my life showed me the importance of the role of an attorney in our society and our community. Becoming literate in the law and policy, not only to protect the ones I love, but then now to also live up to the values that I believe our community should live up to is kind of all the reasons why I became an attorney and why I enjoy being an attorney so much. He takes responsibility, takes initiative, who has a vision for how things could be and is capable of not only imagining that for himself, but painting that picture for others. I met Paul here in 2016. Seattle Clemency Project was putting on a lawyer recruiting training and he really stood out to me. He found something that inspired him and he wanted to jump into action, even though we were clear that it was gonna be a challenge. Paul ended up working on that case and today his client is back in the community. When it comes to doing clemency work or when it comes to doing post-conviction work, the need for it was so great that the more I began to learn about it, the more I felt that I had like a moral obligation or a duty to do something about it with the skills that I've developed. That began with trying to accomplish individual justice through individual cases. And now it's progressed to not only educating folks on the policy narratives that our community is adopting and how we need to make structural institutional changes to reflect those values. Paul's contribution to the Seattle Clemency Project has really gone beyond what we expect any volunteer to do. He's taken on two cases to petition for early release for clients who had life or long sentences, and he was successful in both of those cases. He's assisted other volunteer lawyers on their cases. He's currently Seattle Clemency Project's board president and is providing incredible leadership those boards and those committees are an incredible amount of work. I honestly don't know how he squeezes it in, in between all of his day job responsibilities, his work on pro bono cases, his work on the board of the South Asian Bar Association of Washington. But somehow he manages to find the time because he's one of those people you know, that saying busy people get things done, that describes Paul to a T. Thank you to the WSBA for this honor. Uh, thank you to my colleagues at Foster Garvey who have mentored me and trusted me. And thank you to my family. I would be a shadow of the person I am today if it wasn't for their love. Hello, I'm Justice Raquel Montoya Lewis, and it's my honor to introduce this year's Legal Innovation Award winner, Jacqueline Schaefer. Ms. Schaefer has done groundbreaking work in artificial intelligence, developing ClearBrief, a program that uses artificial intelligence to review citations and legal writing. But she's also used AI tools to improve the practice of law in child welfare and foster care systems while serving as an assistant attorney general in Washington and Alaska, as well as in-house counsel for the national child welfare nonprofit Casey Family Programs. She brings her knowledge and skills in both the law and artificial intelligence to improve outcomes for lawyers, as well as children and families in crisis. I am honored to present this award to Ms. Schaefer and look forward to more innovation in our field with her leadership. Congratulations. Jacqueline really stands out as a lawyer. She really looks at her role as an attorney as a problem solver and as an innovator, how to integrate technology into legal solutions. So when you look at what Jacqueline Schaefer's doing, she really is building the future of our practice. She's thinking about the work that we do as legal professionals. She's giving us better tools. And this is critical because when you look at the volume of the work that we all have to do, whatever sector we're in, it's just going up. And she's giving us ways to get out in front of that wave. And I think that's really important for us figuring out the future of how we are going to serve. I started my career at Paul Weiss where there was such a strong emphasis on perfection in your writing because every brief that you filed, you wanted it to be the absolute highest quality legal work. And I think that's something that really stuck with me. I spent most of my career actually as an assistant attorney general, first in Alaska and then in Washington state. She drew from her background in child welfare really and saw a problem in child welfare law that there was not good use of data to be able to inform decisions. If you don't make good decisions, that can have catastrophic impacts on children and families. 
I ended up writing an academic law review article about how AI will change child welfare systems and courts. And really the thesis of my article was that we can improve our government if we focus AI on reducing the administrative burden of the people who work in the system so that they have more time to actually you know, do the things and the aspects of their job that they love. I'm so pleased and proud of Jackie for her founding clearbrief.ai. It's been such a game changer in the industry. Clearbrief.ai digs in and uses technology in a way that hadn't been done before to support all types of legal writing. It really ties in the record and the facts in a way that is much more transparent and that produces a lot more accuracy. And so then that helps the courts and the judges to make better decisions. So a big aspect of what we're doing is making excellent, accurate advocacy accessible so that using our technology, we can help you quickly spot the mistakes, quickly see the source documents so that we're all on the same page. Jackie has helped me understand that you will only be able to individually serve so many clients because there's only so many wakeful hours in the day. But when you start thinking about product, when you start thinking about creating the goodness and packaging it up in a way that many people can use it, it scales. And there just aren't enough people doing it. So I'm glad she's out there leading the way. Having gone through the difficult times of starting a legal tech startup during the pandemic, it's incredibly meaningful to receive this recognition. It means so much to me and to our team at Clearbury. Thank you. Good evening, I'm retired Navy Captain John Bridge and Chairman and Council Emeritus of Benbridge Jeweler. It's my pleasure and honor to introduce this year's winner of the Professionalism Award, Lieutenant Colonel Melanie J. Mann of the U.S. Marine Corps. This is an award that is presented to someone who exemplifies the spirit of integrity, collaboration, and respect in the profession and there is nobody more deserving than Colonel Mann. Her work in all aspects of military justice is remarkable, from prosecution to defense and command advice. As a military judge, her work is outstanding. In particular, her cert certification programs have been replicated and are used widely throughout the Marine Corps. Just as importantly, she continuously opens doors through her mentorship and advocacy such as the effort to integrate women in all roles in the Marine Corps, including combat. Lieutenant Colonel Mann represents the best in both the legal and military professions, and I offer my sincerest congratulations. I think I always knew that I was gonna serve in some capacity. Both of my grandparents, my grandfather served in World War II. My father served, my brother served. It's part of our family fabric. So as military lawyers, we are members of two very honorable professions, the profession of arms and the profession of the law. And Lieutenant Colonel Mann, or Mel, has just thrived and has done so outstanding serving in both of those capacities. As a legal advisor for a commander or a command, or as a criminal law expert, there's probably three or four names in the Marine Corps, and Melanie Mann is on the top of that list. She was the lead prosecutor for Marine Corps Air Station Miramar, Marine Corps Recruit Depot San Diego, and Marine Corps Air Station Yuma. Throughout that time, she was responsible for all of the prosecution and all the, the criminal law advice to every commander aboard those three installations. Later, she was a commander's legal advisor out in Okinawa. She was also the regional defense counsel for a while out in Okinawa. She is out there advising on international law, on the rules of engagement. She has to talk to pilots, brief them before they go out and fly their mission. So she's what we call a battle jag. When you think about professionalism, it's not just the how you treat other people and your integrity. It's also that your advice is right and that it's timely. So it's that kind of professionalism that Mel brings and what makes her so valuable to the commands that she serves. You can see her trajectory went from the mid-level hard-charging prosecutor to now a senior military judge. And that's all based on her hard work and her reputation. I'm blessed 
that I got to experience the courtroom from all vantage points. It's very important for you to understand what that young Marine or sailor is going through to ensure that they are safe and that they're supported. It's also important to understand the process and your role in it, your role for justice and your role to protect the fairness of the proceedings. Mel is an inspiration to the other women just to show that it can be done. There's probably no more important role that I have in the Marine Corps outside my responsibilities as a judge than mentoring. It's teaching up, it's educating up, and it's supporting our Marines and our Marine officers and our council. Mel is a Marine, so it means that she is strong. She is tough, I'm sure she eats nails for breakfast. But Mel is also a mom. She is the mom of three boys and her husband is a special needs teacher. My hobby is my boys. From running races, to watching their athletics, to seeing the world. Congratulations, Melanie. Keep on charging and taking care of your Marines. Very proud of you. She eats nails for breakfast. Um, what a great group of award winners. Our next award winner is the Savage, Sally P. Savage Leadership in Philanthropy Award, which is presented in partnership with the Washington State Bar Foundation. I'm Cheryl Gordon McLeod, and I'm a justice on the Washington Supreme Court but I'm also a former public defender. I am thrilled beyond words to present this year's award, the Sally P. Savage Leadership in Philanthropy Award to a public defender, Karen Murray. Her day-to-day -day work is the definition of giving. The way that she does her day-to-day -day work is even more philanthropic, not only towards her clients, but she has been a mentor to countless young attorneys over the years. And her public activities, most notably being an architect of the King County Bar Association's Dr. Martin Luther King Annual Awards Luncheon is a testament to that. I am thrilled to be able to present this year's award to Karen Murray. Karen is what philanthropy looks like. The person who inspired me is my mother. She raised eight kids on her own. She always had the mantra, whatever you have, you always have enough to give, even if you had very, very little. When we're talking about leadership in philanthropy, it's about leading others in giving, leading others in service, raising money for organizations. And Karen has done that for decades through the Seattle University School of Law. As a past president of the Lauren Miller Bar Association and as a participant in the Philip L. Burton Scholarship Award Committee, as the co-chair of the King County Bar Association's MLK Luncheon Committee. Karen lives the life of a true humanitarian and a person who's committed to social justice. She's dedicated her life to public service because she saw the richness of life come to the embodiment of the people that she helped. She was raised in love and she communicates love and she passes love on. What inspired me to want to do this work, to become a lawyer, is because of where I grew up, seeing the inequities that occurred and not really knowing that terminology at the time. I just felt it, and I always was fighting for the underdog. The key for me is her ability to serve as a mentor for so many people in the community, and she never says no. She's been a tremendous person to have in my life because, you know, I came to Seattle from somewhere else, like she did. I didn't have anyone sort of like offering me jobs or points of advice. I was the first lawyer in my family. To have someone like Karen to reach out and to say, why don't you come intern with me for a while? Or why don't you come watch me in court? Or why don't you think about this career path or that career path? It was really invaluable. And Karen was ready on day one, on minute one, to step up. Karen, if I've never told you before, and I've told you a thousand times, thank you so much for all the time that you helped feed us. 
over the course of your life, you fed so many people intellectually, philosophically, and your mentorship and their souls. This was definitely the icing on the cake at the end of my 29 plus years in a profession that I have loved for all those years as a public defender. Those I would like to thank is for those who have acted as my mentor, Mr. Don Matson, and then for those that I've learned from since then, and those are my mentees. I grew because of them. This is such an honor, and I am so grateful. I'm Tracy Flood, president of the Washington State Bar Foundation Board. We are so pleased to co-present the Sally P. Savage Philanthropy Award to Karen Murray, who truly embodies the spirit of giving that this award represents. As you just saw, Karen's generosity is well known. Her generosity in her time, resources, and wisdom from her mentoring of young attorneys to her leadership of the King County Bar Association's annual Martin Luther King Scholarship Luncheon. She represents the best of our profession. She was also the first public defender who served as the Lauren Miller Bar Association's president, whom she also received the Lifetime Achievement Award from. The Washington State Bar Foundation provides funding to the WSBA programs that promote equity, justice, and diversity. In our legal profession, donations to the Foundation Board have supported WSBA's diversity efforts to help ensure that the legal profession represents the community and reflects the communities that we represent and serve as well as the Moderate Means Program and Powerful Communities Grants and Projects, both of which have helped promote legal aid to people across Washington State. Your gifts have helped to ensure this access to justice, especially for our most vulnerable populations. Congratulations again, Karen. We are so honored to present you with this award. Now, if you have been inspired by Karen and the other Apex Award recipients this evening, please consider a donation to the Foundation Board. These donations, as I said, will support our efforts to advance equity, justice, and diversity. Thank you. We hope you can all support the Washington State Bar Foundation. And just a reminder, feel free to congratulate the award recipients using the bar handle and hashtag below. Our second group of recipients include the Angelo Petrus Award for Lawyers in Government Service, the Pro Bono and Public Service Award for Individuals, the Pro Bono and Public Service Award for a Group, and the Justice Charles Z. Smith Excellence in Diversity Award. Hello, I am Justice G. Helen Whitener. And I met this year's posthumous recipient of the Angelo Petrus Award for Lawyers in Government Service about 25 years ago. I was a law clerk at the Attorney General's office in Tacoma when I first met attorney Julian M. Bray. Julian spent the majority of his career representing the Department of Social and Health Services 
and the Department of Children, Youth, and Families through the Washington Attorney General's Office. Julian helped found the Pierce County Chapter of Lawyers Helping Hungry Children and volunteered on the City of Tacoma's Human Services Commission, as well as the WSBA's Climb Protection Board, Character and Fitness Board, and Disciplinary Board. Julian was a significant factor in the success of the Family Recovery Court in Pierce County and led the development of the first baby court in our state. I wholeheartedly agree with a supporter who emphasized that Julian was one of the most astute, erudite, influential, and congenial lawyers to have ever served in the Washington State Office of the Attorney General and as a member of the Tacoma Pierce County Bar Association. This award is an honor to his work and the legacy he has left. Our legal community lost one of its true humanitarians. Julian cared deeply about his public service work at the Attorney General's office, particularly his work as an advocate for children in the dependency system. Julian's contributions to the juvenile justice system are immense. His expertise on those issues, his mentoring to attorneys and staff was profound. He had a real gift for very specific issues that he would act on, ensuring that there would be a facility dog to assist young children who were going through excruciating forensic interviews. Julian was the kind of person who would think about that, number one, see the need for that, number two, and number three, act on it, work with folks, bring people together, and make it happen. Julian was a true public servant. He served as chair of the St. Leo's Food Connection Board, he was chair of the Human Services Commission for the City of Tacoma, and he also served on the WSBA Character and Fitness and Disciplinary Boards. Julian cared for his community, where he lived, and for the integrity of the legal profession. It was a pretty easy decision, actually, to appoint Julian as head of our Tacoma office. He had the ability to connect with individuals on a personal level that made him an especially good leader. Julian recognized the impact of hunger on the children in our community. He and another dear friend of his, Todd Carlisle, started the Pierce County Lawyers Helping Hungry Children. I was a new attorney general, and I remember he invited me down to Tacoma. The legal community for Pierce County was out for this breakfast, and once I got there, I realized, oh, Julian's the MC for this event. For any of you who had a chance to see Julian in action, it was like a revelation. He had everybody laughing at 7.30 in the morning, the way he was able to speak movingly about what that organization was all about and the need for people to support it. It just was that blend of Julian, of humor, intelligence, and really speaking from the heart. He was sincere, he was very thoughtful, and he was very intentional. He loved his dogs, he loved his wife, Jen. He was just a truly inspiring individual, and it drew people to him. There was always a crowd of people following Julian, whether it was out to lunch, or just congregating in his office. He was like a magnet. Julian, we, we miss you a lot. We're so proud of you and the contributions you made to our office and to the people of the state of Washington and to kids all across our state. Julian has left his mark on so many individuals. We really lost a, a, a beautiful friend and a wonderful individual. I'm just so grateful that he's being awarded today with the Angelo Petrus Award. He will be forever remembered as one of the greats. Hi, I'm WSBA Governor and U.S. Navy Commander Hunter Abel, and I am thrilled to introduce this year's winner of the WSBA Individual Pro Bono and Public Service Apex Award, Master Chief Sally Webster. This award is presented to an individual for outstanding cumulative efforts in providing pro bono services or who give back in meaningful ways to the profession, the community, or the country. As a senior Microsoft attorney, and the senior enlisted leader of the U.S. Navy Legalman community, Master Chief Webster is an unparalleled leader. She does our profession and our country proud, and I offer my sincerest and most heartfelt congratulations.
I didn't become a U.S. citizen until I was in my adulthood. I'm actually from the U.K. originally. Right after I became a U.S. citizen, I went down to the recruiter's office. It was after 9-11, and one of the options was to join the Navy and work in the legal field. So that's what I did. As the uh, Command Master Chief for the uh, Navy Reserve Law Program, this is the highest position in our community that a person can have. She is the boss of all bosses for all enlisted legal men in the Navy. She truly is someone that everybody goes to for advice and for direction. Her legal knowledge, her experience, and her leadership ability have been profoundly impactful on the entire Naval Reserve law community. It's been a fantastic ride. I've been in a senior leadership position now for over eight years. She has mentored dozens of attorneys. She's led the development of over 100 military paralegals. I think just the caring for her folks is the thing that's impressed me the most in working for her. We need to make sure that the people understand how valued they are and exactly what their contribution is and what it means to our country. In her civilian life, she's a Microsoft attorney, practices intellectual property and other areas of the law at an extremely high level. Sally Webster is a senior attorney in the Microsoft Store legal team. She actually has teams around the world. She really embodies and exemplifies servant leadership. She's members of the steering committee for our military veterans organization. She's always helping you know, mentor and work with younger attorneys and also just the work she does with her client groups. She has been called to service twice, once in 2006 to serve in Iraq and once in 2010 to serve in Afghanistan. In both situations, she's had to leave Microsoft for a year. I would not do anything any differently. It's been a challenge at times to combine both a civilian legal career with a military legal career but I've had some of the best times of my life doing what I've done in the Navy and also at my civilian company. I think that you need to always challenge yourself and that's, that's kind of the motto that I go by. Not only has she been in the reserves and at Microsoft for almost 20 years now at the same time, but she's really excelled in both places. I think that's just amazing. I do think she's an inspiration. And she has helped immigrant children obtain lawful status in the United States. The work that I did supporting immigrant children in need of legal defense was something that was set up by Microsoft as one of their pro bono activities. And it was very fulfilling for me. In one particular case, I was able to work with a child from the age of 12, and he's actually now in college. Hi, Sally. I'm so, so happy you're getting this reward. Uh, I always say this to you, thank you for your service. I couldn't think of an award that's better for you, one that's really honoring someone who gives of themselves and who is serving our community. I hope you really take this one to heart. You deserve it. And the team can't wait to celebrate with you. This isn't an award for me, the way that I look at it. It's an award for the Navy Reserve. It's an award for the legal community. And we all work together, and it's a team effort. For my Microsoft colleagues, I want to thank you all for giving me the grace over the last 18 years to pursue this career in the Navy. And I just want to sincerely thank everybody from the bottom of my heart. Hello, I'm Senator Monica Gingler. Deputy Majority Leader in the Washington State Senate. And I'm thrilled to announce the winner of this year's Pro Bono and Public Service Award for a group, Virtual Help, a collaboration between Perkins Coie, Microsoft, and Legal Hope. Virtual Help responded to domestic abuse survivors' urgent need for access to courts following the early coronavirus restrictions. All across Washington during the pandemic, we saw domestic violence rates, including homicides, increase dramatically. Thank you to Virtual Help for stepping in to help survivors. The groups collaborated to create an innovative program facilitating remote access to courts and pro bono counsel, such a critical service. Congratulations to Virtual Help, to all the participants for the work you do to protect some of the most vulnerable members of our community. Now let's take a look at the work that Virtual Help has done. The pandemic hit, and almost immediately, we saw this surge of domestic violence. Many people are sheltering with their abusers, and they need to get help. So the Virtual Help program is a partnership between Microsoft, Perkins Coie, and our nonprofit Legal Hope to provide survivors of domestic violence with help to obtain protection orders and doing that in a virtual context and really trying to break down those barriers, access to counsel, access to justice, even to the court system itself. 
We jumped in right away and in April of 2020, we hosted a training where we had over 60 volunteers from Perkins Coie and Microsoft. The Protection Order Advocacy Program would refer clients in need of legal support to our clinic. And then Microsoft volunteers would partner with Perkins volunteers to help a survivor prepare the petition seeking protection, and then also provide representation to the survivor in court. We realized we were going to have to come up with some sort of solution where volunteers could access all of the training, the resources, the materials, and also be able to provide strong representation and support to the survivors. What we built was a clinic using Microsoft Teams. What we've discovered is that this is actually a really good way to help people. Even though we created the system during the pandemic because of the situation, it's actually been beneficial to a lot of people because they don't have to take off time for work. They don't have to find childcare. They don't have to go into court and stand just feet away from the person who's been abusing them. And this project has really given access access to people to get protection that maybe wasn't as easy before. And the hope is that even as the courts have been opening up, we will continue to offer this remote service. When we talk about protection orders in King County, we're talking about thousands of protective orders, thousands of hearings, thousands of victims and their children who are in need. How do we help a lot of people and do so effectively, efficiently, that benefits not just victims, but really benefits pro bono lawyers in their practice. And what virtual help allowed us to do is to really see a path forward and to make those things sustainable and to make them things that can be built upon for the future is because of the work that Microsoft and Perkins Coie and Legal Hope did. Facilitating and providing pro bono services is core to Microsoft's mission. And technology is part of our mission to enable every person on the planet to do more. I think this clinic does show that legal advocacy does make a difference. When our survivors are paired with a team of volunteers, they are getting a protection order and that is the desired outcome. It's really been this collaborative effort and not one of us could have stood this up on our own. To our colleagues, Microsoft, Beth Henderson, Leah Medway at Perkins Coie, and Ariana Orford at Legal Hope, congratulations to each of you. I am grateful for your commitment to pro bono, your innovation, and your help for victims. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Jamie Peterson. I'm the state senator for the 43rd Legislative District, and it is my great pleasure to present the Justice Charles Z. Smith Excellence in Diversity Award this evening to James F. Williams. James is the managing partner at Perkins Coie in Seattle, where he litigates complex business transactions. He has a long history of pro bono work benefiting the entire community, and in addition has served in leadership in all sorts of nonprofits, including the Washington Leadership Institute, where it's been my great pleasure to interact with him regularly. Congratulations, James. I was inspired to become a lawyer because I realized very early on that as an African-American male, I needed to understand the rules of engagement in American society if I were gonna survive and be successful. And I figured the best way to do that was to literally learn what the laws are. So I was born and raised on a little farm in the middle of nowhere in South Carolina. I ended up going to a place called the Citadel. It's a military college in Charleston, South Carolina. I got a deferral of my active duty commitment to go in the Air Force. And I used that deferral to go to the University of Virginia for law school. Started my career in the public sector as a prosecuting attorney in the U.S. Air Force JAG Corps. So I came to Perkins in 1993 and I've been here ever since. So I'm at 28 years of service so far. He made an impression on day one because he exuded confidence. He was going around and introducing himself and I found that to be a very great trait for a new lawyer. When you look at James's career, the fact that he has risen to become a managing partner of Perkins Coie, one of the largest, most prestigious law firms in America, that's an incredible achievement for anyone. I always wanted to practice at the highest level. I always wanted to be around extraordinary practitioners. I always wanted to be able to, to be impactful in my community and to influence the lives of others who are around me. So far, all of that has been 
satisfied on the journey. When James got involved in a pro bono case along with the ACLU to assure adequate defense for criminal misdemeanor defendants, the ACLU was asked, why James? And they said, we needed a gladiator. That's a perfect description because when James sets out to do something, he fights to get done what needs to get done. And that's what he did in the Mount Vernon case. And it's made a huge difference for criminal defendants throughout our state. I would say my hobby and or passion outside of work is training the next generation of leaders. And I've been doing that now for the last 17 years through this thing called the Washington Leadership Institute. The WLI was founded by Ron Ward, who was at that time the president of the State Bar Association. He needed that idea implemented, and so he turned to James. And James was the person who, if you will, put the meat on the bones in terms of writing the program and pulling it together. And that was designed to identify, say, a dozen people in the community from underrepresented groups, and then expose them to every single aspect of what it's like to be a leader in the legal profession. When you look around the state, look at the Board of Governors at the Bar Association, you look at judicial officers and other political leaders, we can often identify a WLI alum. So in my opinion, his legacy is that he has literally changed the face of leadership in our state. I feel loved. Loved uh, because of the letters of support and they were touching from people who I've known for so many years and have had so many amazing encounters with. I'm talking about my mentors, my colleagues, my friends. Thank you so much for this, and I'm very honored with this award. We're in the home stretch. Our third and final group of videos include the Norm Mailing Leadership Award, the Outstanding Judge Award, the Lifetime Service Award, and the State Bar's highest honor, the Award of Merit. Hello, my name is Nick Brown, the United States Attorney for the Western District of Washington, and it is my pleasure to introduce the winner of this year's Norma Lang Leadership Award, Edmund R. Witter. Mr. Witter serves as the Senior Managing Attorney for the Housing Justice Project, a service providing free legal assistance to renters facing eviction in King County. Mr. Witter's commitment to advocacy for marginalized communities and his leadership in providing legal aid embody the qualities of the award's namesake, the late King County Prosecutor, Norm Lang. Congratulations, Mr. Witter, and thank you for all that you do to protect some of the most vulnerable members of our community. Now, let's take a closer look at Mr. Witter's work. Edmund is a fierce advocate for tenants, not just King County, but all over Washington State. Edmund has been this tour de force of intellect, passion, commitment, and empowerment for the tenants on whose behalf and in partnership with whom he works. I would see more people lose their homes in one day here in Seattle than I would see in say five years when I worked in New York City in the Bronx. 90% of evictions just happen about rent. It's an issue of poverty. So we're having families, most of whom are losing their homes because of one month or less in rent. So they're falling behind due to a temporary unemployment, they're falling behind because they have a medical emergency, and there was just no safety net there. And even worse, even if there was a safety net, our legal system was not built to be able to tolerate that. So one of the things I really wanted to do when I came out here was, well, let's try to change it. You know, I knew Norm, and I know Edmund. And one of the things that both Norm and Edmund do very well is they build an empowered culture around a sense of justice-oriented mission. The legislature this past year enacted the nation's first law providing for appointed counsel for indigent tenants in eviction cases. And that law really was Edmund's handiwork, along with others, but his leadership was critical for effective, meaningful, and accountable tenant defense services. Edmund also understands civil legal aid values of access to justice and, and commitment to diversity and tackling systemic oppression. It's really a call to action for him. And I definitely see that in the way he has molded the Housing Justice Project. In terms of where we are today, you know, things are better. We've made a lot of legal improvements, changing our eviction laws, making it so that if you do fall behind on your rent, you're given more time to catch up. 
We're working with, you know, a bunch of other organizations to push local cities to enact their own tenant protections that are stronger than what the state has. As we move out of the pandemic across the state, there are more than 150,000 renters potentially at risk of eviction. The renter population is disproportionately black, brown, indigenous, and other people of color, and members of other communities that have very limited legal voice and economic power and the right to counsel provisions of the law that Edmund helped pass really change the power relationships on their behalf. I'd like to thank my staff at Housing Justice Project, the support I've gotten from the King County Bar Association, Washington Low Income Housing Alliance, Washington Community Action Network. I could not have done anything without my partner, Allison, and our sons, Theo and Owen. Happy smiles. Hello, I'm Justice Deborah Stevens of the Washington State Supreme Court, and I'm honored to introduce the winner of this year's Outstanding Judge Award, my dear friend and former colleague, retired Chief Justice Gary Alexander. Like me, I suspect most of you have always known Gary Alexander as Judge Alexander, a title he has held since 1973, when at the young age of 37, he was first appointed to the Superior Court. Throughout his career, on the trial court, the Court of Appeals, and from 1994 to 2011 on the Washington State Supreme Court, Justice Alexander has demonstrated what it means to be both a great judge and a great human being. Patient, humble, kind, and a natural peacemaker, he was the state's longest serving Chief Justice and he was and remains a strong voice for equal access to justice and open courts. Thank you, Gary, for your enduring leadership and for your friendship. Congratulations on this well-deserved award. Gary Alexander is a wonderful man who has dedicated his whole life to the law. I had a very active trial practice during my years as a young lawyer. My judicial career started 1973, almost 50 years ago. Total of 19 years in private practice and 38 and a half years on the bench. For the Thurston Mason Judicial District for 11 years, the Court of Appeals for 10 years, the Supreme Court for 17 years, living in Olympia, my hometown, where I was raised and schooled, and at 85 years of age, I'm quite contented. I've known Justice or Chief Justice or Judge Alexander since the early 1970s, Gary made every day we served together better. He never came in with other than a smile. He was an outstanding trial lawyer, appellate lawyer, and chief justice. Gary is Mr. Judiciary. He also is Mr. Olympia. He was inducted recently into the Olympia High School Hall of Fame. And you can't go anywhere in Olympia with Gary and not run into someone who was greeting him, hugging him, and very happy to see him. He never has lost an election in his life, whether it was in high school, college, the Elks Club, trial court, court of appeals court, Supreme Court. Not many people can run for that many offices and always win. I sort of enjoyed the election process. I think it's a good thing for judges to face the voters. You learn more about the community that you're serving, that makes the job so wonderful is the variety of cases that come before you at, at all three levels of court that I served on. For most people, coming to a lawyer or going to court is an unusual experience and one that most people don't really look forward to particularly. And so I think it's very important how we, as lawyers, treat people that come before us and how judges treat people that are in the courtroom. He was elected three times in a row to serve as Chief Justice by his peers, something which has never happened before. He kept the door to his personal office open at all times. We had a very collegial atmosphere among the nine justices on the court. That doesn't mean we agreed on everything. We didn't. We disagreed a lot on cases, but you can disagree without being disagreeable, and that's what I always tried to do. I didn't really want to leave the court I had to because of the mandatory retirement provision. I would like to stay at least to finish my six-year term. He's still doing tours. He still goes out and talks in the community. Gary, you've done a lot for a lot of people over the years. 
and you deserve this award for being a great judge and a great guy. Mazel tov. The award by the Bar Association is truly worthy. He's been an outstanding judge at every level. He served the people of the state of Washington, the judiciary, very well. Gary, my congratulations, and the award is very well earned. Thanks, Gary. Good evening. I'm Justice Mary Yu of the Washington State Supreme Court, and I'm so pleased to announce the recipient of the 2021 Lifetime Service Award, Mr. William Henry Gates II, better known to all of us as Bill Gates Sr. He was the best of American lawyers, a true believer in the rule of law and the civic duties that flow from that privilege. He was also a true patriot, someone who believed that we build and strengthen our democracy best when we share our talent and resources locally and globally with those who are most in need. Mr. Gates held on to the principle that one must be fully engaged in one's community by showing up because showing up is the most authentic demonstration of what really matters. And finally, those who had the privilege of working with him know that he exemplified genuine empathy and humility in the gentle way he walked in the world. So some of you may wonder why would the Bar Association even give out a lifetime award posthumously? The answer is that recognizing Bill Sr. is a way of holding him up as an exemplary individual. It is a way of saying this man is worthy of recognition. And more importantly, it says to each of us, this is someone we should all strive to emulate. Congratulations to Mr. Gates' family. And let's tune in for more info about Bill Gates Sr. He saw the law as being the foundation of society. He thought that lawyers had an obligation to make the legal system work. Bill had a very strong sense of justice. It was that kind of thing of what is right, what is just, and what's gonna make a difference in this world and making it a better place. He was concerned that there were many people who could not afford lawyers. He supported legal aid societies as well as pro bono cases. The compulsory Washington State Bar Association that we all have to belong to in order to practice law in the state of Washington benefited from the leadership of Bill Gates because he said the most important issue facing the bar was access to justice. That started the access to justice task force that included Legal Foundation of Washington Law Fund, Washington State Bar Association governors, the judiciary, legal services organizations all over the state because of his efforts that we have made a dent in this big need. Most law firms were not diverse. There were very few women. There were very few people of color. And he really wanted to equal the playing field. Bill Gates was the first one to give me an attorney job. I think the way he inspired me as a very young lawyer was to demonstrate that the public good was something that we could all take part in and participate in as lawyers, and that that's what we should look for in our own futures is ways to serve. I met Bill Gates in the early 1970s. He was president of the Seattle King County Bar Association, now the King County Bar Association. He took the floor when they were considering making a donation to the University of Washington for the Minority Scholarship Program. And he spoke so genuinely about the need to have Blacks progress in the law. How can Blacks share in the society? He said one way is through the practice of law. I think what motivated Bill throughout his career was his optimism. He once, when he was sound asleep, said, I am an optimist. <laughs> and it was very true. His ambitions were to be a good husband, a good father, a good citizen, a good lawyer, a good philanthropist. He really focused on other people, and I think that's one of his great legacies. His life lives on in 
the people he's left here, the lawyers, the city, and his family, and his work shows in all of those areas. I want to congratulate the family for giving us this great lawyer. And I hope the Bar Association changes the name of the Lifetime Achievement Award to the William Gates Senior Lifetime Achievement Award because he is the personification of what was best and what should be best for Washington State Bar Association members. I expect that 50 years from now, today's young attorneys will be remembered for upholding a high standard for the legal profession so that the law can be an instrument of justice, just as it is intended to be. Thank you. Hi, I'm Chief Justice Stephen Gonzalez of the Washington Supreme Court, and it's my pleasure to introduce this year's Award of Merit recipient, David A. Pettis. Mr. Pettis, a partner at Perkins Coie, has been heavily engaged in pro bono work with the ACLU and Seattle University's Korematsu Center for Law and Equality to protect the rights of protesters during the 2020 racial justice movement. Their work resulted in a temporary restraining order against the use of chemical irritants and projectiles. Mr. Perez continued working on behalf of protesters, arguing that the police had violated the order, resulting in a stipulated injunction and finding of civil contempt against the city of Seattle. Mr. Perez said, after witnessing repeated and blatant violations of protesters' constitutional rights, we had to act. A nominator wrote, David has raised the stature of lawyers in and amongst the bar and the entire community of Washington State. We all benefit from David's pro bono work. Congratulations, David, and thank you. I nominated David for the Apex Award of Merit for his work on behalf of Black Lives Matter Seattle King County. David represented them after protests on behalf of George Floyd against police brutality resulted in the indiscriminate use of tear gas, pepper spray, foam tip bullets against peaceful protesters in the streets of Seattle. He decided to take this case pro bono because the First Amendment rights of protesters were so important to him. Night after night, more protesters would come to the streets to demonstrate against police brutality, demonstrate for accountability. And night after night, they were met with yet more brutality. And there was no end to it. And I think the kicker for me was the city had promised to stop using tear gas. And then that Friday, they used it again. At that point, I knew we needed a court order. And so I texted Professor Bob Chang, the executive director of the Cormatsu Center. I emailed the ACLU. And then that day, I also emailed eight attorneys at Perkins Coie. Sunday at 11, we had a call. That night, we had a draft complaint. On Monday, we filed. And on Tuesday, we had a TRO. Temporary restraining order to prevent the city from using certain less lethal weapons without precise targeting of those against whom they would need to use the weapons. Before, they were just scattershot, just tear gassing an entire neighborhood, throwing blast balls like they were hard candy or beads at Mardi Gras. I mean, this was not proportional. And because one person's breaking a window doesn't mean you get a tear gas a thousand people. David is my lawyer in his leadership. Bringing that team together and representing us deserves without question in my mind, the award of merit because of his courage. I know the police department can peacefully control crowds and I know they can identify those who work against that and they don't have to treat the entire crowd as though the entire crowd were violent protesters. Most of the crowd was not. And there were many folks who felt unsafe protesting in Seattle, demonstrated in Seattle. This case was for you. This case was to make sure that I can take my two daughters, whom I would not have taken because I was too afraid of their getting hurt. Take your kids to protests. Take them to demonstrations. It's safe to do that in Seattle. And here we had a case that said the rule of law matters and it says you can say, you can demonstrate, you could protest 
against police brutality without fear of more police brutality. The city decided to settle the contempt motion and agree to a revised order that to this day is the most comprehensive order in place throughout the nation. This is not something new in David's practice. This is how David practices. And it's that kind of courage that raises the bar, raises the communities and raises the community's understanding of what legal work is really all about. Thank you first and foremost to our clients in this litigation. It was just so brave and courageous for them to step forward. It wasn't easy. But I also want to thank our teammates, the ACLU, the Fred T. Korematsu Center, and at Perkins Coie, and to my family, my two daughters, my son, and my wife, Elvira. What a night. And what an amazing and inspiring group of award, award recipients. I want to thank all of you who watched tonight uh, very much for watching this inspiring event. And good evening. I hope you enjoyed the show. Thank you to all of our award nominators for the time you took to highlight these incredible legal luminaries. If you know someone who deserves an Apex Award, nominations open in January. Big thanks to Interchange Media who created the award winner videos, and to Gunther Group for their help producing our virtual award show. Good night, everyone.